Witamy w Akademii Pszczelarza. Dzisiaj naszym gościem jest Norman Carrick z Uniwersytetu w Sussex. Hello. Hello. So maybe for a little warming up you will say what you are doing at uh, your university. Uh, I um, work at the university in something called the Laboratory of Apiculture and Social Insects and uh, we work on all aspects of social insects but particularly honeybees. Because it's the most important social animal for human, right? Yeah, honeybees are very important as they pollinate a large proportion of the crops that we grow. And uh, I must ask it before you are from uh, Britain. Uh, do you often use buckfast bees in your apiaries? Uh, we don't, no. no the, the, the buckfast bee was developed by a monk called Brother Adam at Buckfast Abbey, which is in Devon, in the southwest of England, in the 1930s. And he was concerned that the bees that were in Britain were not very disease resistant. And so he thought that hybrid bees would be better suited to the environment. And so he produced this hybrid bee uh, from bees brought from all over the world. And uh, they were specifically designed for collecting heather honey from Dartmoor, which is a, an area of high ground near, nearby the Abbey. That's, I must admit, that's really surprising because this was your invention, this bee, and uh, it's very popular in Poland and also, as far as I know, in Denmark and Germany. So could you just point out why? Why? Because it seems to be a good bee. Why did you do that? I think people, beekeepers in Britain, found it was not particularly suited to their conditions. There are a few commercial bee breeders who offer something that they call buckfast, but I'm not entirely sure what their bees are. <laughs> and I'm also not entirely sure what the buckfast bees that you can buy in Poland or Denmark or Germany are, uh, and how they relate to the original bee that Brother Adam developed. We need to point uh, out that the buckfast bee is good just in first generation after breeding because uh, heterosy, right? I'm, I'm not sure if that's true, actually. I mean, B Brother Adam achieved it by first generation crosses of various pure strains, and then he was back crossing to introduce other strain, uh, other characteristics from other bees. Uh, so his intention was that the buckfast bee would breed fairly consistently and true. And so hybrid vigour should have disappeared many years ago. So the, the advantages of the buckfast are not as far as I'm aware because, because it's an F1 hybrid. It's, it's, it's a much sort of purer strain than that. So uh, the buckfast bees that are sell, uh, now uh, sold from Denmark or from Germany are not bees that Brother uh, Adam in, in invented, right? I don't know. They're, 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 it, it's many years, and Brother Adam died 20 years ago, and, and there's no active bee breeding at Buckfast Abbey. So the Buckfast bees in Denmark and the Buckfast bees in Germany will have been developed by the breeders in those countries, uh, and uh, therefore will have diverged from the original Buckfast strain. So what is the most popular uh, race or subspecies in uh, Great Britain? In Britain, I suspect most beekeepers don't know what strain <laughs> they have. Um, so many beekeepers, I mean, not many beekeepers rear their own queens and not many beekeepers import queens. Uh, so I suspect most, most beekeepers really don't know what, what strain they have. But uh, Actually, from the genetic point of view, it's uh, good because you have bees that are adapted to local environment. So maybe this is the, the good decision that... I, I think it depends where you go. So the original native bee in the British Isles was the, the dark European honeybee, Apis mellifera mellifera. And we know that imports of other bees have taken place for 150 years or so but it's probably the case that the further you go away from London and the southeast of England, the more likely you are to find pure dark European bees. So there's a recent study that shows that most of the bees in the island of Ireland are pretty pure 
native bees. And so in Cornwall in the southwest, in Wales in the west, and in Scotland and north of England, the bees are probably fairly pure Apis mellifera mellifera, but in the southeast of England they will be much more of a mixture. Mixture with? Many other bees that have been brought from around the world, probably predominantly Italian bees and Carniolan bees, but, but bees from many different places have been imported over the years. So I bet that the most of our viewers would ask you how you manage to fight with Varroa in Britain? Do you have some tricks? Uh, in general, beekeepers treat. Uh, to start with, they used Baverol and then Apistan. Uh, so I should say Varroa was discovered in 1992, so we've had 25 years of dealing with it. Uh, and initially, Baverol and Apistan were very effective, but within about 10 years ago, the mite became resistant. Uh, so many beekeepers use a thymol gel, Apigard. Uh, my colleagues at Sussex University in recent years have been using oxalic acid very successfully. Uh, and of course, at the university, we are also trying to breed hygienic bees that are tolerant to Varroa. It is the top topic, uh, the, these uh, bees that, are, that has uh, hygienic behaviour. Yes. So, uh, what do you think? How long we need to uh, wait until we have bees that can, uh, that can manage by themselves with varroa mite? Well, there are various populations of bees around the world which for one reason or another have been left untreated and have survived. Uh, probably the best documented is uh, an experiment that was set up on the Swedish island of Gotland where several hundred colonies were established on this island and then left untreated for several years to see what happened. And after two or three years, a small number of the original colonies survived and there were swarms from the original colonies and so the scientists have ever since been trying to understand the mechanisms by which those bees have survived forever. And did they discover something uh, special? There are various factors that are important. They only form quite small colonies so there's never very much brood for the mites to build up in. They swarm quite a lot uh, and they also seem to uh, express uh, some degree of resistance through hygienic behaviour, possibly grooming behaviour as well. The scientists are, are not sure. But one of the other factors you need to think about in a closed population is that as well as uh, selecting for resistant bees, you could be selecting for mites that are not very prolific because very prolific mites will build up in the colony, kill the colony and destroy themselves. So the less there is always a tendency between a parasite and its host for the host to become resistant and the parasite to become less virulent. And so in the closed population on Gotland, that seems to, seems to be what was happening. There are changes in both the mites and the bees. So what you are saying that the uh, bees that is, are resistant for varroa are also, from beekeeper's point of view, useless because there are swar swar swarming tendencies and they have not enough brood, right? Yes. So the, the, the Gotland bees are not ideal for beekeeping yet. Uh, and so the scientists are interested in whether they can uh, improve those bees they've got to make them worthwhile for, for beekeepers. But it may be that beekeepers in general, if we're interested in varroa resistant bees, need to accept bees that are perhaps less prolific than the bees we had 20 or 30 years ago. So, if you were a Polish beekeeper, yep. the young beekeeper that starts his adventure with bees, what would you do with knowledge that you have now, what would you say to our young, uh, maybe not young, but the, from the uh, beekeeping point of view, young uh, viewers, what they should do? Well, I, I would say there's a huge amount of evidence now that locally adapted bees survive better for a whole variety of reasons. So 
rather than looking abroad to find bees that are better than the ones you have, uh, you need to start with the bees in your area uh, and then select from the best of those for maybe a range of things. But you can also achieve a lot by culling out the unsuitable ones. So you can cull out any that show signs of disease, you can cull out any that are bad tempered and, and you can actually make a lot of progress by getting rid of the bad bees um, and then you can think about improving the best ones. Uh, I must admit that it's really funny because uh, I talked with uh, Per and he said what they did in Denmark and he said you should do what uh, Danish people do and you are telling that uh, we should do what British people do. <laughs> That's good that we can uh, that we can learn from other nations. So uh, underline this, we need to work on local populations, maybe we could let out some honey production, but the, this hygienic behavior or uh, varroa resistant uh, treatment, the uh, treats are more, more, uh, more, uh, these are the treats that are more uh, valuable for us, yes. right? Yeah, so I mean, at the university, we have been selecting for hygienic behavior uh, using a test that uses liquid nitrogen to kill some of the brood. And uh, I should explain that hygienic behaviour is a natural tendency for bees to be able to detect diseased brood, to uncap those cells and throw out the pupae, taking the disease with it. Uh, and this is a naturally occurring trait that seems to occur in about 10% of bee colonies and it's something that is known to be heritable so that you can by selective breeding improve it. So we have been using this freeze killed brood test in other parts of the world particularly in Germany and elsewhere they use a pin prick test to do the same thing but as an alternative uh, our beekeeper at the university we found had with his own bees over a period of about 20 years what he had been doing was he culled out all colonies that showed signs of chalk brood, a fungal disease, and when we tested his bees using the freeze killed brood technique, we found that he had actually produced hygienic bees by selecting against chalk brood. He was actually selecting for hygienic behaviour. Um, so this is something that any, any beekeeper could do. So. Uh this is really uh, important message that every beekeeper, even the smallest one, can do something for whole population, right? Yes, yes. And particularly if beekeepers can cooperate and uh, could actually agree to use the same strain of bee over an area and to do the same things, uh, it's possible to dramatically improve the population in an area. So to actually do a formal bee breeding program, you need quite a large number of colonies, 50 to 100 or so, and not many amateur beekeepers will have 50 or 100 colonies, but a beekeeping association in an area, by working together, can achieve quite a lot quite quickly. So uh, let us leave our viewer with this message, it's really important and it's really simple, but good one uh, advice and thank you for, uh, very much for coming and telling us all these things. That's right, thank you. Thank you.